Now, seeing people know you for yeah. the, the prediction. You believe the system today is more fragile. More fragile than, than it was, was in 2007. Yes. Exactly. When we had the greatest financial crisis. It's the same fragility that we have from 2007 that we masked. In, in more than 70 years. And Stuart, when I said it's going to be the biggest market downturn in my lifetime, I mean, that's not so strange to me. 2008, we had a problem because of too much debt. Stuart, as you well know, the debt has skyrocketed sure. since 2008. Yeah. So when I say it's going to be worse in my lifetime, how could it not be? By the way, in regard to the stock market, it's artificially inflated uh, by cheap money that the Fed is printing out and giving to banks, for instance. They're supposed to loan that money out to small businesses, but they haven't done that. They just use that to buy their own stocks. Uh, and then, um, you know, you don't have Americans going out and buying their products. So when you see the prices go up, remember, it's these, you know, corporate CEOs, uh, executives. <laughs> Outstanding student loan debt rose 29 billion to 1.41 trillion as of March 31st. Is setting up now for a market crash that will be the worst in modern American history. The global situation has created an environment for financial panic. The financial panic conditions have been in place for quite a while. And the fundamentals of that are what Janet Yellen said, the loan bubble. There's $250 trillion worth of debt out there. Yes, un unemployment rate is low, but you have to look at the quality of jobs. These are not quality jobs. The wages matter quite a bit, and they remain stagnant. And these are people who have you know, this huge debt burden just so they can have an opportunity to get a decent job in this country, right? Um, and when they're paying it back, it's such a huge portion of their income that they can't save, they can't be part of the economy in, in ways that the generations before could. They can't buy homes, cars, all that. But also they can't save for retirement. Less than 40% of uh, non-retired adults think they have uh, a, enough money to be on track for retirement. So people are suffering. Don't let anyone lie to you about how the economy is booming under Trump. Taking money from their tax cuts and cheap money from the Fed and just buying their own stock. So the underlying reality of the stock market is based on artificial money printing. It's not real. And when they go to bail out the bankers again, whoo, we're going to have a whole different animal on this, in this country. Rising interest rates have always hurt property. So next time around, you're going to have property with problems again. You have stocks with problems again. You're going to have bonds with problems again. Bonds, the last time we had an economic problem, were not a disaster because the interest rates, they were already still fairly high. So they could drive bonds higher and higher. You can't do it this time around. So you're going to have stocks, bonds, and uh, property suffering next time around, which will probably mean some currencies will suffer around the world. No, it's not going to be fun. IMF world economy about to get very sick. Lots of warnings coming well, up. Well, everybody is loaded up with debt, and it's not like we we began the uh, this monetary experiment without much debt. We had a lot of debt in 2008. In fact, the financial crisis was about debt. It was about our inability to pay the debt that we had. But instead of addressing the problem and allowing uh, debt to be paid down, uh, the Federal Reserve led us down the primrose path into much deeper debt by keeping interest rates at zero and holding them there for so long, the Federal Reserve actually encouraged an overly indebted nation uh, to borrow even more money. When you think kind of eight years into one of the biggest bull markets in the history of time is not the time to be adding risk. Why would you want to buy a market when it's about as expensive as it has ever been in history? Bear markets are the authors of bull markets, and bull markets are the authors of bear markets. The thing that worries me more than anything else is what happens when these machines have to start selling. This bubble is deeply systemic. Volatility like we've never seen before. We're going to have a recession when, when rates normalize. And if you think otherwise, you're delusional. I think we're in the biggest bubble ever experienced. It feels to me like we are very close to the to the end of that of that bubble. We're going to have the worst bear market of your lifetime. That's the everything bubble. There's no place to hide this time. 
While a small, elite, wealthy segment was purchasing assets, the rest of the population felt the widening income gap as wage increases failed to meet expectations and the cost of consumer goods kept on rising. According to the Federal Reserve, Americans collectively owe over $1 trillion in credit debt. I think the greatest threat domestically to the country is this $21 trillion debt hanging over the cloud of America and future generations. And the fact that interest rates are going up, we're going to be paying close to over $400 billion in interest expense, which, which I think is the, the number one or number two issue in terms of federal expense to the country. You say that a huge sell-off is coming, the biggest in my lifetime. And Stuart, when I said it's going to be the biggest market downturn in my lifetime, I mean, that's not so strange to me. 2008, we had a problem because of too much debt. Stuart, as you well know, the debt has skyrocketed yep. since 2008. Yep. So when I say it's going to be worse in my lifetime, how could it not be? And I think that the crisis that is coming is going to be a dollar crisis and it's going to be a sovereign debt crisis. That's the only way that this thing is going to end. So we're now running approximately $100 billion a month deficits in the United States. That's $1.2 trillion a year and rising, right? Because as interest rates are going up, the cost of financing the debt keeps going up, in addition to the fact that the debt is going up because we're borrowing more money. But this is basically more borrowing than we did under Obama during the height of the Great Recession, 2009, 2010, that time frame. And the economy, in theory anyway, isn't even in recession. Yet we're borrowing all this money. So government spending is off the charts. Borrowing is off the charts. Not only uh, are the budget deficits exploding, but the trade deficits are record highs as well. The national debt, which is now $21 trillion and rising. But when you total all forms of debt in our society together, it comes to a grand total just short of $70 trillion. Many people seem to believe that the debt imbalances that existed prior to the great financial crisis of 2008 have been solved. But that is not the case at all. We are living in the terminal phase of the greatest debt bubble in history. And with each passing day, that mountain of debt just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. It simply is not mathematically possible for debt to keep on growing at a pace that is many times greater than GDP growth. And at some point, this absurd bubble will come to an abrupt end. Let's talk about the consumer debt first. Excluding mortgage debt, consumer debt is projected to hit the $4 trillion mark by the end of the year and their total tab for consumer debt could reach a record $4 trillion by the end of 2018. That's according to LendingTree, a loan comparison website which analyzed data from the Federal Reserve on non-mortgage debts, including credit cards and also personal and student loans. Americans owe more than 26% of their annual income to this debt. That's up from 22% in 2010. It's also higher than debt levels during the mid-2000s where credit availability soared. We have never seen this level of consumer debt before in all of US history. In the first quarter, the delinquency rate on credit card loan balances at commercial banks other than the largest 100. So at the 4,788 smaller banks in the US, spiked in to 5.9%. This exceeds the peak during the financial crisis. The student loan debt bubble has also surpassed a trillion dollars, and the average young adult with student loan debt has a negative net worth. Despite economic and stock market gains over the past nine years, Americans aged 25 to 34 with college degrees and student debt have a median net wealth of a negative $1,900, according to a report analyzing the 2016 Federal Reserve data. That's a drop of $9,000 from 2013. Corporate debt has doubled since the last financial crisis. 
thousands of companies are so highly leveraged that even a slight economic downturn could completely wipe them out. According to forecasts from the bank's chief economist, the federal deficit will increase from $825 billion, or 4.1% of gross domestic product, to $1.25 trillion, 5.5% of GDP, by 2021. We are literally on a path to national suicide. Today, the average American household is nearly $140,000 in debt, and that is more than double median household's income. And if we were to include each household share of corporate debt, local government debt, state government debt, and federal government debt, that number would be many times higher. All of this debt will never be repaid. Ultimately, there will come a day when the system will completely collapse. The central bank bubbles bursting, it will be ugly. The global economy has been living through a period of central bank insanity, thanks to a little understood expansion strategy known as quantitative easing, which has destroyed Main Street and benefited Wall Street. Central banks over the last decade simply created credit out of thin air, snap a finger, and credit magically appears. Only central banks can perform this type of credit magic. It's called printing money, and they have gone on the record saying they are magic people. Increasing the money supply lowers interest rates, which makes it easier for banks to offer loans. Easy loans allow businesses to expand and provide consumers with more credit to buy goods and increase their debt. As a country's debt increases, its currency eventually debases, and the world is currently at historic global debt levels. Simply put, the world's central banks are playing a game of monopoly. With securities being bought by a currency that is backed by debt rather than actual value, we have recently seen $9.7 trillion in bonds with a negative yield. At maturity, the bondholders will actually lose money. Central bankers became the rescuers of last resort as they snapped up government bonds, mortgage securities and corporate bonds. For the first time, regulatory agencies became the world's largest investment group as they are attempting to rectify their negative yield bond purchasing with purchases of stocks. This is keeping the game alive for the time being. However, these stocks cannot be sold without crashing the market. Who will end up losers and winners? Middle America certainly isn't going to be happy when the game ends. Pending home sales fall in August to the slowest pace since the start of the year. That this month, analysts at JP Morgan, Society Generale, and Morgan Stanley have all recommended investors to start paring back their U.S. exposure. And what are you going to do? Go into the emerging markets that are submerging? When you put this all together, the Ponzi scheme is coming to an end. So, which is that we are once again almost back, not quite, but very close back to the tightness of credit spreads that we had before the financial crisis. And when you look at the loans that are being made, particularly for private equity leverage deals, so-called covenant light loans, you look where the high yield market is trading, it's all a little bit scary. So the corporate sector generally is highly levered. Uh, and um, it faces significant interest rate risk. Uh, if, as the Fed is trying to engineer, we have a significant move up in interest rates, uh, you're going to see that flow through the corporate sector in a way that's going to limit investment capital and profits. Um, and I think the same thing is true for the federal government. Uh, you know, the federal government's fiscal posture is really uh, quite precarious. And, you know, today we're spending almost as much on interest as we are on Medicare. Uh, mm. If interest rates go back to their post-war norm of 6 to 7 percent uh, for the 10-year Treasury, interest costs will double. Um, mm. That is going to create a political crisis. As Ray Dalio said, that would create a political crisis here in the United States, putting enormous pressure on Congress either to raise taxes 
or to cut spending in the in the face of a potential recession. Yeah. I think I think the fiscal crisis of the it's just around the corner. So I'm more worried about investor losses and then the cascading effect that could have economically if there start to be defaults and credit spreads blow out again. And but then secondly, you allude to a, a big problem for the future, which is the shadow banking uh, system and the fact that so much lending is now happening in an unregulated fashion. Totally, totally agree. We've been talking about that all, all week as well. Uh, Jim, to your point, though, on, on the deficit here in the U.S., that conversation is nothing new in that I know it's getting worse, but the conversation's nothing new. So when do you feel like the tipping point's going to be for that to create a real crisis? Well, you know, just look, we've had a, we're in the ninth year of a recovery from uh, the recession created by the financial crisis. You know, I don't think the business cycle's been repealed. And ordinarily during a recession, federal revenues go down and spending goes up because we have a series of so-called automatic stabilizers that kick in, unemployment insurance, food stamps. So a deficit that's running uh, close to a trillion dollars today, at the end, you know, in boom times, uh, could easily be a trillion five, a trillion six uh, in a recession as a result of uh, revenue declines and increased uh, spending. Um, this is this is you know this is a that would be seven or eight percent of GDP a deficit equal to seven to eight percent of GDP that's a that's a third world country's deficit not the United States of America so in this sense Ray Dalio is right um, the real risk is um, that fiscal irresponsibility right. at, on the hill right. creates a dollar crisis and okay. a dollar crisis will radiate through right. the rest of the world. When you hit zero interest rates, you have a different type of debt crisis. You have more likely to have a depression. So I think the period that we're in is very similar to the 1935-1940 period. Let me just um, explain that in a minute. Um, 1929 to 1932, we had a debt crisis and interest rates hit zero. Not 2007 to 2009, we have a debt crisis that hit zero. Then in both of those cases, there's only one thing for central banks to do, and that is to print money and buy financial assets. They print money, buy financial assets in both of those times. That pushes financial asset prices up, puts a lot of liquidity in, and also contributes to a greater wealth gap. Because those who own financial assets benefit when those who don't own financial assets. As a result, in both periods of time of the wealth gap, and the economy not improving for a large segment of the population, we have populism. So the last time that we would say when was populism popular, it would be in, the, uh, in that period of time. The Fed and other central banks in varying degrees are beginning to tighten monetary policy. Asset prices are sensitive to monetary policy because the duration of those assets is lengthened. And so the, it, central banks have to be very careful not to raise interest rates much faster than is built into the curve. But with that populism, uh, we have an issue. Um, so if we think about what the next downturn will be like, the downturn, I think, will be very different than the one in 2008. It'll be one in which um, I think that the social and political problems will be great because of that wealth gap and populism. I think there'll be more conflict. Right now, times are good, and we're uh, sort of at each other's throats in that. I also think, I also worry about the effectiveness in monetary policy in reversing that because monetary policy uh, has interest rates, and we can't lower interest rates as much, and it has quantitative easing, the purchases of financial assets to push other financial assets out and get liquidity into the system. And that is at its maximum. So when we have a downturn, we're not going to have it to be as effective. I think also the downturn um, in our form of debt crisis won't just be do debts. It'll also be pension obligations, health care obligations, unfunded lob obligations. So, so and I think one, one more thing, and I think it'll be um, about um, us having to sell a lot of treasury bonds to the rest of the world, and I think that that'll also be an issue. And I think it'll be more back there of a dollar crisis. And I think it'll be more of a political and social crisis. This is not a minor matter. As our financial system unravels, the seriousness of it will become evident to all as the need to pay for our extravagance becomes obvious. This will make the country much poorer, though the elite class 
that manages such affairs will suffer the least. By the time the QEs ended, the central banks of the world had increased their balance sheet by $8.3 trillion, with only $2.1 trillion worth of GDP growth to show for it. This left $6.2 trillion of excess liquidity in the banking system that did not go where the economic planners had hoped. Central banks now own $9.7 trillion of negative interest-yielding bonds. The financial system has been left with a bubble mania financed by artificial credit and unsustainable debt. The national debt in 2007 was $8.9 trillion. Today, it's $20.5 trillion. Rising interest rates will come and that will be deadly for the economy and the federal budget. This inflationary policy is generated by the belief that there is no benefit in allowing the needed economic correction to the problems generated by the Fed to occur. The correction is what the market requires, not the resumption and acceleration of the dangerous inflationary policy that caused the bubble economy. I haven't seen anything like this probably since uh, just before the last crisis, 2006, 2007. Everybody was optimistic on the market then. Of course, they were optimistic in 1999, 2000, just before that plunge. But, you know, the, the, the exuberance could be even more irrational now than it was then because people have to overlook even larger problems today than the problems that they overlooked Back. Of course, the real culprit has been the Fed. If you go back and remember uh, my premise, I wrote that the Federal Reserve, because it kept interest rates too low for too long, had inflated a housing bubble. And that because of that housing bubble, there were a lot of economic distortions. That a lot of money had been spent based on the wealth effect, and that a lot of loans had been uh, issued based on overpriced collateral. And I wrote that when the housing bubble popped and real estate prices fell, that we would have the worst recession since the Great Depression, that banks would lose a lot of money on bad mortgages. And so some banks would fail. I wrote that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would go bankrupt. I wrote that the economy would contract because a lot of the spending that was associated with the wealth effect and home equity loans would go away. And that's why we would have this deep recession. I wrote that unemployment would top 10% and that budget deficits would reach $1 trillion per year. All of that happened. Now, what I also wrote in that book was that in response to this, to this great recession and this financial crisis, the Federal Reserve would repeat the very mistakes that caused it. That it would print a bunch of money, it would slash interest rates even lower, and try to reflate the bubbles that had just popped in the stock market and in the real estate market. And the consequence of that monetary policy would be a dollar crisis and a big increase in domestic inflation. That is the only thing that hasn't happened yet. But it's about to happen. What I didn't necessarily understand back then is how long the lag would be between the policy that I knew that they would enact in the aftermath of the crisis they created and the, the end result of that policy. And in fact, one of the reasons that I didn't uh, foresee that long uh, a lag was because I thought that they would just attempt to reflate the bubbles. I didn't think that they would succeed. In fact, they have succeeded in a spectacular way. They have managed to reflate larger bubbles than the ones that popped. That is why the crisis that we're headed to is going to be so much worse than the one that we left behind, because we have bigger problems. We have had lower rates for longer. The bubbles are bigger. There's a lot more air that has to come out. It's the same problems now that they ignored back then, only much, much bigger. The difference being it's not going to end with just another financial crisis. It is going to end with the dollar crisis that I have been warning about for years. And it's going to be that much worse because the dollar is that much more overvalued. And because of the delay, we have been able to screw the economy up even more. 
We have been able to go even deeper into debt. We have made even bigger economic mistakes. The economy is even more vulnerable now. The government has more debt. Corporations are more levered. The whole economy now is more vulnerable than it was back then. So if you thought the Great Recession of 2008 was bad, where do you see what's coming? The same financial architecture that surrounded mortgages in 2008, asset-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, and naked credit default swaps. When the next crisis hits, it'll be a surprise to the regulators. Somebody will come to their door, as AIG did, and say, hey, I need a bailout. Now remember, the bailout was paid by the U.S. taxpayer to the tune of trillions of dollars. And the bailout was thought to be, well, we know this is not a popular thing to do to bail out these big banks who are stronger than ever. But if we don't do this, there's going to be a systemic break in the economy and we will have the Second Great Depression. There have not been so many trouble signs for the global economy in a very long time. Analysts are sounding the alarm about junk bond defaults. The smart money is getting out of stocks at an astounding rate. Mortgage rates are absolutely skyrocketing, and Europe is already facing a full-blown financial meltdown. Since the last financial crisis, our long-term debt problems have just continued to grow. And there are many that believe that the next crisis will actually be far worse than what we experienced 10 years ago. So how bad are things at this moment? The smart money is getting out of stocks at a rate that we haven't seen since just before the financial crisis of 2008. Wall Street hasn't been this scary since the depths of the global financial panic in 2009. We know last year, 2017, was one of the historically least volatile markets we've seen since the mid-60s. So it's not too much to say we expect a more volatility in 2018. But what we are seeing, we're really in a lot of volatility. Here's a stat for you. 27 days so far this year, I've seen a 1% move either up or down on the S&P 500, only eight last year. If you extrapolate that out a whole year, that comes out to just over 100 days with the 1% move. You got to go back to 2009, 2008, the last time we saw years with that much volatility. Moody's is warning that a particularly large wave of junk bond defaults is coming. And as I have written about so many times before, junk bonds are often an early warning indicator for a major financial crisis. According to the FDIC, a closely watched category known as assets of problem banks more than tripled during the first quarter of 2018. What that means is that some really big banks are now officially in problem territory. U.S. Treasury bonds are having the worst start to a year since the Great Depression. Mortgage interest rates just hit a seven-year high, as they have been rising at the fastest pace in nearly 50 years. This is going to be absolutely crippling for the real estate and housing industries. Retail industry debt defaults have hit a record high in 2018. We are on pace for the worst year for retail store closings ever. The two largest economies on the entire globe are on the verge of starting an international trade war. The largest economy in the world, Italy, is in the midst of yet another financial meltdown. In fact, this one appears to be the worst yet, and there are fears that it could spread to other areas of the Eurozone. German banking giant Deutsche Bank just announced that it will be cutting another 7,000 jobs as it seeks to turn the page on years of losses. If Deutsche Bank fails in 2018, it will essentially be a Lehman Brothers moment for the entire planet. America's greatest economic collapse coming. Debt to GDP makes it clear. America is in the midst of the greatest crisis in its 242 years of existence say this based upon the U.S. federal debt to GDP gross domestic product ratio. This chart takes America from 1790 to present. From 1776 to 2001, every period of deficit spending was followed by a period of austerity where on federal spending was constrained and economic activity flourished, 
repairing the damage done to the debt to GDP ratio and the credibility of the US currency. But since 2001, according to debt to GDP, the US has been in the longest ongoing crisis in the nation's history. But what is this crisis? The chart points out that debt to GDP surges in order to resolve the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, and World War II. But the debt to GDP surges since 1980 seem less clear cut. But simply put, America and the world grew up and matured, but the central banks and federal government could not accept this change. The chart shows the debt to GDP ratio, but this time against the decelerating growth of the total US population as a percentage, that's the black line, but also against the faster decelerating growth of the 0 to 65 year old population, yellow line. The federal government has cumulatively spent and goosed the economy by $74 trillion to increase annual GDP to its current $20 trillion. This is $53 trillion in unfunded liabilities, which should be there now, collecting interest to pay for future distributions. Instead, this money has already been spent. New debt must be issued if the obligations are to be honored. If we count the federal debt plus unfunded liabilities now beginning to come due against GDP, we have a very unhappy picture. However, if we juxtapose federal debt and unfunded liabilities versus the annual growth of the total and 0 to 65 year old population, a clear inverse relationship is shown. Using the Treasury data set, debt plus unfunded liabilities taken from the 2017 Treasury Bulletin have risen to 380% of GDP and are set to eclipse the previous high seen in 2009 in short order. Fascinatingly, according to the Treasury, the advent of Obamacare massively temporarily reduced the unfunded liabilities, shifting the liabilities off the federal books. But the temporary reprieve is over. The Social Security surplus is over and will turn to progressively larger outright deficits from here on. To maintain deficit spending, the federal government will need to run significantly larger deficits and issue significantly more U.S. Treasury debt just to cover the OASDI deficits. This will mean significantly larger issuances of marketable debt, while nearly all natural sources of Treasury buying have turned to net selling. This is a crisis that will define the nation, the world, and determine the course of the world for at least the next century, if not further. As always, make of this what you will. Where the mistakes are going to lead to catastrophes. Okay, so that's, that's what you exactly. were doing that's in the lead-up to 2008. And that's what we're here to discuss today. Where, where is the vulnerability? Why is the world today more fragile than it was, say, in 2007? Or, it's I, more I, fragile today than it course. was in 2007. Of course, because we have, the same, we have the same symptoms. We have absolutely the same disease. You put Novocaine on cancer, you put Novocaine on cancer, and what happens, the patient isn't going to get better. He's going to feel better, look better, maybe for a while, and at some point you, you have a higher price. Think about it. What was 2007? What was a crisis of debt? It was a debt crisis. There's no what question. We have, we have a lot more debt today. <laughs> but it's in different that. places. There's been a uh -huh. consumer deleveraging, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and the housing market isn't nearly uh -huh. as levered as it was back then. Yes, but you don't get a free lunch. In other words, in different places, it doesn't make a difference. Now, where is it? It moves to governments from, uh, you know... And corporate balance sheets. And corporate balance sheets. And corporate balance sheets, of course, it did fuel the stock market rally with corporations either investing their cash, you know, when, with zero interest rates in uh, their own stock or borrowing in, in many cases. I mean, we have two point some trillion dollars additional corporate borrowing. And then, of course, governments. Governments, they think they borrow for free. Till, aha, they, they need to borrow a lot. So either they got to print money or borrow 
uh, at higher and higher rates. I mean, we have to borrow more than uh, this year, more than three, uh, more than one point some trillion dollars. That's trillion dollars or something. And then think about it. We're incurring higher and higher. Um, when you say we, you're costs. speaking of the we, U.S. We, government. U.S. government, we, uh, uh, taxpayers, we're paying for it. We're paying, you know, uh, 300 and some tri uh, uh, billion dollars of interest. Every higher year. rates, every year. higher rates, more interest, higher rates. You may enter a spiral. What does that mean? It means we, if, if we, what is a debt spiral in your mind? In my, in my mind is when governments have to borrow. It's like a Madoff scheme, when you have to borrow more and more to pay interest. A Madoff scheme or a Ponzi scheme, but let's name it, call it Madoff, is when you have to borrow to repay creditors. And that's what we are doing. The, the minute you enter that phase, there's, uh, there's nothing healthy about it uh, from an economic standpoint. That there is a large amount yes. of federal debt yes. is not new to the United States. Yeah, but we have we, we, we accumulated an additional trend, ten, uh, ten, some ten trillion last last phase since the crisis. Right. Okay. That's not that's, that's and, and even more now with the tax cut of and course, the need. Whatever. We're accumulating to more and more. Plus we have hidden the deficits. Plus we have hidden liabilities that should count as debt. Like Social Security, you have hidden liabilities. You have hidden uh, liabilities when you have to bail out firms. When you have uh, we have hidden liabilities from student debt that, that, that are not going to be. I mean, you have. You have a lot of things, uh, a lot of debt that, I mean, if, if you're so, committed to, 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 to some expenditures, so on top of the nominal debt, you have some hidden uh, liabilities that should count like debt. Nassim, let's work yes. with your analogy. Yes. Right? Every Ponzi scheme eventually collapses. Everyone, practically. This Ponzi scheme, I mean, in, in, there ways, in, again, in your term, yes. is going to collapse as well? I mean, we're starting to see, uh, uh, you remember years ago, we had crisis, we had debt crisis, and it starts in countries like Argentina, mm -hmm. starts in, uh, in 82, it started in, 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 in Latin American countries. Today, this is hitting the core, it's not the periphery, this is hitting the core. We start to have countries like Italy, uh, uh, and it's getting close to us ourselves. We have to borrow a lot. So. The point, how do you get out of the accumulated, like for example, in the US, uh, usually what do you do to get rid of that? In the past, okay, the normal solution is inflation. But the minute you start creating a little bit of inflation, it's so uncontrollable. It's an animal that we have learned uh, from the 70s, it's not easy to tame. So if you increase, if you increase, uh, try to increase the base inflation, Hope, 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 hopefully to you know to work yourself out of debt. It's going to be uh, the price, you know, stability will not be there, and it's going to be un un traditionally has been not controllable. So I think we're hitting a point where you have you need buyers for your debt. Sure. Uh, the Chinese and 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 the oil producing states, you know, were regular customers. Uh, maybe they're not going to be there. Okay. Plus you need more and more. In 2008, we transferred the debt from individuals to the states. Okay, that's 2008. So you had at least a way to do things. And we could lower rates as monetary policy to zero, which of course didn't help because you don't cure a structural problem with monetary policy. It should be there only as emergency measure. Now, 10 years later, okay, we're starting to raise rates because you have to raise rates. You can't keep them at low level. It's unhealthy to keep them at low level. You're gonna raise rates. So someone's gonna pay the price. Who's gonna pay the price of higher rates? A lot of people who benefited from that free money, namely corporations. Over, UK, over levered corporations. And, or, and especially real estate. So the, the first shoe to drop would be probably real estate. Real estate because real estate is very sensitive. Okay. And the higher end real estate has already been gone down worldwide without anybody know. I mean, people talking have about it because people notice, but they don't talk about it because it's not shown yet in the numbers because that's what quantitative easing increased among other bad things inequality and um, so uh, real estate uh, is yes. most vulnerable the higher I mean, end real estate first right and then the rest of real estate so you, as we saw you predict another collapse in the real estate market it will start with real if anything odds are will start real estate and then we'll you know we'll see well, like what comes after replay. that stock market I mean think now seeing people know you for yeah. the, the prediction if you you believe the system today is more fragile 
more fragile than, than it, it was, was in before. 2007. Yes. Exactly. When we had the greatest financial crisis. It's the same fragility that we have from 2007 that we matched. In, in more than 70 years. We so where mask. do we go from here? Do we go to uh, okay. a, a, another crisis that's worse than no. the last one? What, what we need, it, the thing that would save us, all right, miraculously, is, is either growth that we, without debt, what we're seeing here now is 4.2% growth with debt, doesn't work. Real growth, maybe miraculously, would take us out. Or maybe some kind of inflation <laughs> that would not be caused too much price instability. And, and we've never seen that. Okay, a smooth inflation. Unless we have these two, all right, we're, we're doomed. Look, look at what will happen from interest rates. We have to borrow more than a trillion, okay, today uh, for next year. Now, if you raise interest rates, and we have a lot, if you raise interest rates 100 basis points, think of the cost on the total debt, okay? We're already paying, you know, part of the deficit. 380 billion come from interest servicing, so debt servicing. So think about it. You have a... Um, you have a, uh, a spiral coming from that that you have to borrow more just to pay the interest more and more. That's a deficit by itself. Ever since that 2008 morning, when the Treasury noticed billions disappearing from the U.S. economy, the Federal Reserve has been locked in a desperate struggle to keep this event at bay, and it hasn't worked. They've even been flooding the U.S. economy with more new money than ever to try to make up the shortfall credit system worth more on paper than the national wealth of most countries, and it's already starting to come apart. They're already doing everything they can, and now they're running out of time. Trade wars never work, and it always leads to real war. We can talk about how Trump's tariffs have had an, uh, already had an effect on the U.S., and it's not a particularly good one. I am growing more worried that we're going to go down the rabbit hole here and that the pain and economic pain and suffering is going to be a lot much greater than than I had uh, than I had thought. If you look at this from an economic perspective, Manila, and say what's going to happen, the bottom line is we have a lot of commerce with China. And if we think is it going to harm us, we've talked about Boeing being impacted by steel and aluminum, your beer cans, your soda cans, etc. Yeah. But if you are a Walmart shopper or you shop at Dollar Store or Dollar General, pretty much 99% of everything in those stores is made in China. This trade war will not end well if it continues down this route. When you put this all together, the Ponzi scheme is coming to an end. As the United States raises interest rates, oh, pending home sales fall in August to the slowest pace since the start of the year. Well, now the mortgage rates at what? It's approaching 5% for 30 year, a more 30 year mortgage. Exactly. Which is still and historically cheap which is historically cheap, but when you're not making any money, it's historically high. And that's why you're seeing some 32% of millenniums still living with mommy and daddy because they can't even afford to rent an apartment, let alone buy a house. Home sales are not only declining, but also they're lowering the home sale prices. We're at the be go take a walk in New York. There's like 20% vacancies in the retail sector, even on Madison Avenue, one place after another for rent, for rent, for rent, for rent. The Chinese economy, you're looking at debt to GDP ratios of over 300. You're looking at Chinese debt from when Clinton allowed them to come into the World Trade Organization. And in the 90s, it was about um, 500 billion about 30 years ago, actually. Now they have over $30 trillion worth of debt. So what I'm saying is gold is the ultimate safe haven. The markets are going to, going to collapse. The people, 160 to 70 trillion in global debt. Now it's close to your number. I mean, it's right at $250 trillion now globally of debt. So we exploded the debt in the last 10 years. How bad as a trends forecaster do you see this getting for the man on the street? It's going to be terrible. And it, let's take a global look. You know, look at the migrant crisis going on. People flooding out of countries to find a job someplace. Look at the, uh, South Africa. We're talking about gold. I mean, they're in a recession. Take a trip around the world. 
Where do you like? We, I was talking about Argentina. Let's go to Honduras. Hey, how about Nicaragua? Well, let's go up to let's go up to Venezuela. Let's take a trip through Africa. Uh, look, Indonesia. They're doing wonderful right now, aren't they? Look at their rupiah. It's one country after another. Look at the numbers, the lousy, rotten numbers coming out of the eurozone. They're hardly growing at all. And, and, that's, and what did they say? We're not going to raise interest rates maybe until the summer of 2019. And then you have the Fed saying, well, we're going to raise interest rates again in December and three or more times in 2019. So now you have the dollar way up here, not because it's so strong, because interest rates are higher, the dollar gets stronger, and all of these other currencies are declining. So they, they have built the perfect storm. It's, it's going, going to be worse this time in America. It's going to be the wor- It's going to be worse than the Great Depression. When this thing crashes, it's gone. When this top collapses, it's going to be the shock heard round the world. Currencies are crashing around the world. Name the country, look at the facts, and then say, okay, how is this going to get better? By pumping more cheap dough into it? What do they still have negative interest rates in Europe? They still have negative interest rates in Japan. Who ever heard of negative interest rates? And you're seeing what the Bank of China is doing to shovel more money into there to keep that alive because their investment infrastructure, overall investment in China, it's at 1992 lows. A trade war would cause foreign investors to stop buying U.S. debt instruments and could end the dollar's world reserve currency status. Something happening here What it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going on 